Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Lunch Update, our program that helps you stay curious, connected, informed, live, in real time. Uh, this conversation, like all of our Lunch Update programs, is made possible by our presenting sponsor, Perkins Cooey. But we also want to make sure that we thank our Accelerate sponsor, Baker Tilly, and our recently added small and emerging business sponsor, Easy Office Products. Thanks to all of you for the support. Uh, like we always do, we record these and then we make them available on madisonbiz.com. Uh, we have had a pretty good turnaround of getting these up yet the same day. And so if there's something that uh, you want to listen to again, share, certainly we love when you put it on social media, uh, please go to our website at madisonbiz.com and you'll find the link there. Coming up, we'll be joined by Madison Mayor Rhodes Conway. Uh, but first, let me just run through some quick chamber updates. Uh, we invite you to help kick off this year's Big Night Out series on uh, March 9th, which is a Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. For this series, we will be visiting and showcasing beautiful nonprofit spaces. Uh, you'll be able to enjoy drinks and appetizers as always and great conversations because you're able to be in person. You can explore the theaters and the studios and the community spaces that we will be featuring at My Arts, which is Madison's new Youth Arts Center. Thanks to our Accelerate sponsor, Catalan, and to Krauss Anderson, and to also a small and emerging business sponsor, Easy Office Products, for supporting this event. Admission is free for chamber, event, for chamber members, and you can register now at madisonbiz.com. Also, save the date for April 13th as Icebreaker returns to the Kohl Center for the first time in three years. This annual luncheon is the only business event on the floor of the Kohl Center, and we cannot wait to see that venue come to life in person once again with all of you there. Stay tuned for more details about that event, including the speaker and registration information, which will be coming shortly. Uh, also, as part of uh, Icebreaker, we are bringing back the Ground Floor Award, award which took a, a little hiatus during the pandemic. Uh, nominations are now open for this year's Ground Floor Award, which is for small business leadership. The Ground Floor Award recognizes true champions of small business, the recipients of the, war, of the award of their leaders and their businesses inside the Four Corners, but also in the community and through their efforts, we want to see how they've helped other small businesses succeed. These are the mentors, the advocates, the contributors that have all continued to develop and prosper in Greater Madison and in Greater Madison's small business community. Our past recipients have been Jim Garner from Sarginian's Floor Covering, Susan Walgren from Culver's and the Echo Tap, Jeff Patterson from JP Hair Design, and Mark Schmitz from Zebra Dog. If you know any business leader, small business leader, who deserves recognition, please nominate them. Um, you can uh, do that at our website uh, by going uh, uh, to, again, madisonbiz.com. And if your nominee is selected, you'll receive a free ticket uh, to attend Icebreaker, where the award will be presented. And now for today's guest, Sasha Rhodes Conway is the 58th mayor of Madison, having been elected in 2019. Her previous elected experience included three terms on the Madison Common Council, where we shared the term as colleagues. Uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway is the co-chair of the climate, uh, climate Mayors, an appointed member of the EPA Local Government Advisory Committee, a founding member of the Mayors for Guaranteed Income, and a member of the Mayors Against Gun Violence. She serves on various committees and task force for the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities. Bef before being elected mayor, she was the managing director of the Mayor's Innovation Project and a senior associate at Cal's, the Center of Wisconsin Strategy at UW-Madison for 13 years. And prior to her time at UW, she evaluated uh, state endangered species programs for defenders of wildlife, researched and wrote progressive and environmental policy for the State Environmental Resource Center, and taught undergraduate biology and ecology, something I've forgotten. So welcome, Mayor. It's good to see you. Thanks, Zach. It's good to be here. Um, we just saw each other last night at the, the ribbon cutting for the Dean Clinic St. Mary's SSM uh, Fish Hatchery Clinic, which was uh, great to see that building go up in the neighborhood. Uh, so, Mayor, when we created this program uh, back in April of 2020, um, 686 days ago, uh, you were the very first guest. Um, we, we decided we needed to do something to give access to decision makers and to our community's leaders. You and I spent about an hour uh, talking exclusively about COVID-19 and what our community response would look like, 
how how do we comply with health orders? And at that time, it was the state's health order, the the safer at home, flatten the curve. We all remember, maintain hospital capacity. And now, two years later, you're joining us as the county indoor mask requirement is about to expire. I'm curious as you think about that time, but even looking more importantly, looking into the future, what does the future without health orders look like in Dane County? Too? Well, Zach. That- uh, you know, hopefully, and I think we could all agree on this, hopefully it looks healthy, right? I mean, that that is got to be our first um, priority uh, in, in all situations. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, the course of this pandemic mirrors uh, the course of former pandemics. And if we can learn anything from the past, um, I think we are going to continue to see potentially waves of variants over you know, the next year, the next two, three years, potentially, before we really get into a state where we can, from a public health perspective, call this thing endemic. Um, Now, does that mean that, you know, next year is going to look like last year? Probably not. Um, But I do think that that, um, looking forward, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get to uh, ignore COVID-19. But uh, I'm hopeful that we can use the tools that we've got to uh, keep things under control, to keep our community healthy, and to preserve, again, uh, you know, as always, capacity in our healthcare system, which, as you know, is increasingly stressed, uh, both because of, of case counts and hospitalization, but also because of the workforce issues that healthcare is facing. And um, so, uh, you know, I think that that if we all can stay up to date on our vaccinations and normalize the use of masks when it's appropriate um, and make that something that it is perfectly acceptable to do, um, even though not required, um, you know, I think we, we have the tools that we need to protect ourselves. Yeah, yeah I, I think, um, you know, watching businesses moving towards a mask welcome policy, right? Like encourage welcome. Um, how, you know, when you think about, I mean, you're one one level of government, and you're in a, you know, just based on the uniqueness of the of the way the public health board is and and uh, office is set up. You're when we say local government, it's really county and city. Um, but you have the state, you have the feds. When you think about all those layers of government, what do you see the local government's role moving forward? I mean, as you think about what we've learned over the last two years, how do you how do you view the local government role in pandemic mitigation moving forward? Well, as with many things, um, local government is closest to the ground, closest to the people, right? We probably have the best sense of um, where in our community it's um, more difficult to access the resources that you need. And so I think really that's one of our primary roles, uh, which we've been doing all along, right? But to continue to provide education, to provide testing, to provide access to vaccination, um, connection to care, um, particularly in um, neighborhoods and for communities that might have less access than others. That, that I think, is a really important role um, for local government um, and something that, that I think our public health department has really leaned into and is, I think, doing a pretty good job of. Um, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're going to have to continue to, to monitor what's going on in our healthcare system and our hospitals in particular. And um, we're going to have to continue to, to watch for new variants. And I, I, that's not unique to the local level, right? That's going to have to happen at every level of government. Um, and similarly, I think at every level of government, if we get into a situation where we need to have public health orders again, you know, I imagine that public health will do that. I imagine the state will do that. The CDC will do that, right? But I, you know, my fingers are crossed that we don't get into that situation again. And um, but, you know, what if there's anything we've learned, it's that we can't predict what this virus is going to do. Um, so, I, but I do think that our most important role is to be connecting directly with the community uh, because we know it best and. Um, to be getting out good information and helping people access um, both the, the healthcare that they need, but also the tools that they need to protect themselves from the pandemic. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, and, you know, we as an organization would agree with the, you know, the idea that, you know, the local government has the best 
um, view of what's going on. We we were the first and maybe one of the only business organizations that lobbied for your for your right to have mass orders. Um, but I'm curious that you know the the in order to maintain this, there has to be some elasticity to public health, right? That they've got a whole other set of jobs they do yeah. on a regular basis and they keep us healthy. I mean, that's their role and they do right. it in making sure that our food is, is safe and our water is safe. And, um, but so how do you maintain that elasticity? If there's no, you know, if the federal money doesn't continue to flow, how do you maintain that sort of local role of um, be ready to spin up at any moment? Or is that something that may just be too much of a challenge for us locally? You know, I think it's going to be difficult, no question. Right now, um, public health has built out, I think, a, a pretty good plan uh, around continuing to staff at appropriate levels uh, to deal with COVID-19, but also spinning up some of the other functions that um, got lost over the last two years. Um, and that is, so that transition is underway right now. And, um, and I think that's important, right? We, we set aside some really important things that we need to be doing again. Um, uh, and I think that's, you know, frankly, that's true of, of all of local government, um, not just public, public health, but um, it is going to remain a concern. And, you know, frankly, as long as the state continues to really dramatically constrain uh, local governments in terms of our budgets, um, it's going to be difficult for us to imagine doing what we need to do without federal funding. Um, you know, right now we're, we're in a good position because the Biden administration has provided a, a good chunk of funding that uh, was needed and is going to allow us to sustain positions dedicated to COVID-19 um, for a little while yet. But yeah, at some point that's going to run out and um, we're going to have to figure out what to do at that point. You know, one of the, and this is a, a follow on that I just, um, you know, thought is that, you know, I, you know, both publicly and privately in our conversations, I know that you have viewed vaccines as the path forward and we agree, right? I mean, vaccines, you know, is and was the, the path forward and that we find ourselves in this moment largely because of the fact that as community was trusted to do what it needed to do. I, um, what role does that play in the future, that sort of trust that, um, you know, looking back and saying this is a community that has stepped up and done what's been asked and what's been needed. As you look forward, does that, you know, does that weigh into your decision making about, okay, we've watched this community do what it needs to do and we can trust the collective to take care of ourselves a little bit more than what we might see in other places? Is that, does that play a role in your thinking? It does. Uh, you know, I think that, that our community has really done a remarkable job. Um, you look at our vaccination rates and they are way better than the rest of the state and, um, and other places in the country. And, um, you know, it's, there's still some categories of folks that I'd like to, to see uh, be more vaccinated. Um, and particularly our kiddos, and obviously the, the youngest kiddos don't have that option yet. Um, and, you know, we, we see with the, um, a little bit of a drop off between the initial series and then the boosters. Um, and I, let me just take the opportunity to say it's really important to get boosted. Um, and, and this is likely something, you know, similar to a flu shot, right, that we're going to have to continue to do, right, we're going to need to stay up to date on our, our COVID-19 vaccinations. And um, that's not something that we're going to just be able to say we, we did it and it's done. Um, so I do think, though, that we can trust our community um, once those shots are available uh, to get them. And that definitely makes a difference in thinking about, um, you know, what else needs to be happening um, if people have the protection of the vaccine, um, it just makes it a lot easier, I think, for our community overall. And, and all, you know, all along, we've been talking about layers of protection, right, between you and the virus. And so being up to date on your vaccination is, is probably the, the first and most important layer. Um, some folks will want to go beyond that. Um, in terms of their masking behavior or how close they're willing to stand to somebody else or how much they're willing to go out. And um, I think that's, that needs to be um, not just uh, accepted, but encouraged um, for everybody to be able to calibrate their own comfort level with risk. Agreed. Um, from the beginning of the pandemic, I, you know, I, I know you've heard me say this. Um, we've said it to everybody who's on the call today. They've, they've heard us say it that there is an important balance between public health and the needs of our com uh, economy and then public confidence. Those were the three sort of pieces of the equilibrium is what we called it. Um, 
you know, I'm and you and I've talked a you know number of times publicly and privately about the need to maintain confidence, right? And I, I, I compliment you on. I feel like you you used language throughout the pandemic that didn't instill fear. That you, at least as an elected official, um, understood that public confidence, business investment confidence, employee confidence, consumer confidence, all those things were going to matter. In fact, we even used a quote of yours from this show in a video that we did. Uh, just reassuring people that we're going to get through this. Um, but I'm curious, as you think about more than words, what is the city doing or what has it done to focus on rebuilding that confidence and helping us accelerate into our recovery? Well, it's a great question, Doug. And I, I, I'm actually feeling pretty, pretty good about this right now. I think, um, I don't know if you've um, seen the numbers on, just for example, the pedestrian counts on State Street being very close to, to pre-pandemic and um, you know, we're starting to see not just downtown, but uh, around the city, um, like uh, commercial and retail vacancies are, are starting to get filled, you know, maybe not as fast as we'd like, but definitely moving in the right direction. Um, so I do feel like um, that confidence is coming back. Um, and some of it obviously is is beyond our control, right? There's a, there's some national narratives around uh, the pandemic and how safe people feel. And, um, you know, I do think that Madison in particular has been broadly more cautious to, you know, to our last conversation um, about uh, their behavior. Um, but I think um, I'm feeling positive about this. You know, throughout the pandemic, we um, we've tried our best to support local businesses in a number of ways. I mean, obviously, one of the most exciting was the streeteries. Um, and, but, you know, we also uh, talked with local employers and adjusted, for example, adjusted our bus service for essential workers. Um, and, you know, like every other level of government, you know, we have done some direct funding programs uh, to local businesses. And I think that all has been important. Um, now, just to touch on a few things going forward, um, at my direction, staff started some months ago to develop a permanent streetery program, which has now been introduced with me as the lead sponsor. And um, I'm hoping the council will approve that quickly. I think that's a really valuable program for our community. And our board this morning took a unanimous vote. We supported the original temporary, but our board voted this morning for the chamber to lobby on behalf of passing the permanent. So thank you. Oh, for great. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's great to hear. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited about that um, program. I think it'd be really positive um, for, uh, particularly for the service industry. Um, and, if, you know, we're going to continue the economic development programs that we've prioritized um, throughout the pandemic. A and particularly those that are targeted towards building wealth in communities of color. And I hope we'll get a chance to talk in a little bit more depth about that because um, I think we've been doing some, some good work there. Uh, and then, you know, of course, there's these larger issues that are um, impacting our economy uh, that we were working on pre-pandemic and I feel like are even more important to work on now. And, and that's the, the big things around housing and transportation and infrastructure and quality of life because, you know, none of that's gone away, right? That's all still relevant. And it all still plays into how people feel about Madison um, and people's desire to, to come out into our neighborhood business districts. And um, so we're gonna continue to focus on those things as well. You know, one of the things after this call, I have an economic partner call and it's one of the legacy from your office called us again, I think in March of 2020 and said, you know, this is all hands on deck moment. You know, can you guys help us communicate with the business community, with our economic partners? And we started convening that call and still goes on today, um, which is where the pop-up came from, the culture came out of that. It was your staff and the Black Chamber, the Latino Chamber, the Hmong Chamber that, you know, brought that to fruition. And so, um, you know, there's, th those are the things I think will continue forever. I mean, they're born out of the pandemic, but have purpose moving forward. I can one tell you. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say one thing that, that, that I think really has come out of the pandemic, which is a, a immensely positive thing, is that sense of collaboration. Right. And and it, it did start in a sort of panicky all hands on deck, like we just everybody needs to work on this. Um, but I think it really has grown um, in, you know, in a number of different spaces. The, the level of collaboration, I think, is much higher. Um, it just, you know, just for example, um, you know, I meet 
much more regularly with uh, the, the heads of other uh, local governments and institutions uh, than I did pre-pandemic. And that we, we're not only talking about COVID-19, right? And that's a really positive thing. And the, the collaboration that you referenced, I think is really positive. And so I, I think that that is one thing that has come out of the pandemic um, that will stick and I think will be really positive for our community going forward. So one more question about the pandemic and then we'll, we'll switch gears. I, I can tell you're in the office. I'm in the I office. Am. <laughs> um, the city council does not meet in their office. And so I have a question for you. Uh, you and I were both uh, common council members. We were colleagues. Um, and, you know, we watched the common council meetings. They're all virtually since the beginning, you know, beginning of the pandemic. And it appears they're going to keep doing it at least for a couple more months, even as we're all transitioning to this new uh, health order phase. Uh, and you've been a local, a vocal and local supporter of returning to in-person meetings. Um, and I, I think the quote was, you called the virtual meetings incredibly detrimental to our functioning as a body. And then you wanted to say, this virus isn't going anywhere. It's a sad fact that every single one of us has to figure out how to live with the virus for the rest of our lives. It's time to start figuring out what that means and how to function, not just on a short-term emergency basis, but on a long-term living with the virus basis. And yet they still ignored you and decided to continue to meet virtually. In your view, I mean, why is it so? You know, why do you, why are you so adamant about returning to these in person meetings? So, it, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, it, it, virtual meetings have been. I mean, certainly they were a gift during the pandemic, right? And a, a very important tool for us. And I think that there's a place for some bodies, uh, including some city bodies, to keep meeting virtually. And um, the council, however, I, I think that. The virtual meetings have um, really inhibited the ability of council members to get to know each other, to form positive working relationships, um, and to, uh, you know, remember that they're all human <laughs> and uh, that they need to, to work as a body together. I mean, this council literally has never been in chambers together. They were sworn in virtually and they have literally never met as a body in person. And I think you see the results of that in the meetings, I, in, in um, how they um, talk to each other uh, and um, the length of the meetings. And I just feel like um, they need to be in a room with each other physically uh, to have those moments, right? That when humans are are face to face, um, you know, not actually in the meeting moments. Although I think that will help too. But the the before and after and in between and on the breaks, where you just like, you know, are chatting with another human being, right? And I I think I think they need that for each other, and I think they need that um, that face to face interaction with staff as well. And yeah. um, so I do feel like it, it would, it's really important for them to, to all be in the same place. And, and, you know, the other thing, Zach, is that somewhere around 60% of city staff don't even have the option of working virtually because of the nature of their jobs. And the other 40% who have been teleworking, um, you know, are now mostly back in the office, at least part-time. Um, and so for the, the governing body uh, of the city to, have their, all their staff coming into work at least some of the time and not being willing to do it themselves, I think is, it's not a great look. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think our personal relationship is an example of why it's important. I mean, like you and I, were, uh, we argued a lot on the city council. Um, we've disagreed over pandemic implementation. We've disagreed over, you know, mass order extensions. I, you know, I probably won't shock anybody on this call that you and I have even yelled at each other privately over, over the mask orders. Um, but I am, I, I, I think the fact that you said, you know, when we asked you to come back on, the mask order was still in place. There was a chance you were going to extend it. We, we could have been sitting here talking about an extended mask order or the likelihood of an extended mask order. Yet we had a relationship enough where we could trust each other to be civil and to be reasonable and to, you know, do our best to stick to the facts. And so I, and, and I agree with you. I, you know, I sort of marvel at the city council as it stands today. And I'm, I hope that they um, see the opportunity to get back together and signal not just to the city staff, but to the rest of the community is, you know, we can meet and we can be together and we can do it safely. Yeah. So one thing that has struck me as interesting in all of this, that 
Um, I think it was maybe the silver lining of the virtual. You alluded to it. It was the blessing in the beginning. But the increased public participation seems to be maybe a blessing and a curse. Um, but do you see that piece extending on? You know, do you think that letting the public participate virtually, even if the body is in person, do you see that as something that will continue? You know, it's interesting. I think initially we did all think that being virtual was going to lead to increased public participation. Um, ultimately, I'm not sure that it has. Um, I, I don't know that our um, volume of public comment is up. I think we have maybe shifted who uh, comes uh, and certainly have made it easier for people from out of town to, to give testimony, which is not really the point. Um, but I, I think, you know, what we've seen is that when there's a, a hot topic, people come in, whether it's in person or virtually. And um, when it's not a hot topic, then, you know, people, it doesn't matter the mode. Um, but nonetheless, it is important for us to increase access uh, to city government any way we can. And so staff are working hard on uh, trying to provide a hybrid option. And um, that's something that is not gonna um, happen soon. I think we're looking at a, a minimum several months. Um, there's some equipment issues. You'll be shocked to hear there's some supply chain issues. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's gonna take us a little while, but it's definitely our goal to um, to maintain some way for the public to, um, I don't know if it will be literally zooming in, but to zoom in um, virtually and uh, while the body is is in person. Right. Well, you you alluded to it um, earlier, and so I, I, it was you know something I wanted to get to, and so let's move away from um, you know the pandemic and the pandemic relief and start thinking about what is the I think the language you used is it's, what is the Madison that we aspire to be, um, and you know one of this. The business community's top priorities in our in our advocacy agenda is to make Greater Madison the best place in the country for entrepreneurs of color to own a business. I've heard you talk about it many times. It's a goal that you share as well. You know, I, I'm interested as to what are the plans, what are you doing now, but you know, what are you thinking about for the future and how the city is going to help advance that goal and ensure that this this region is an inclusive place and a, with opportunity for everyone um, to own a business. Well, let me say first, Zach, uh, thank you for making this a priority. Um, and thanks to the entire business community for understanding how important this is for our community. And um, I really appreciate the work that you and the chamber have done to date on this and um, look forward to more partnership on it. Um, it is very important that we uh, make sure that uh, folks have equitable access uh, to being an entrepreneur and to, um, to success as a business owner. Um, there's a number of things that the city has done, will continue to do. Um, I think some of the things that, that are um, most exciting, you referenced the pop-up shop program, um, the Culture Collectives on State Street. I think that's a fantastic example of collaboration and um, you know, want to shout out to uh, J.D. McCormick Properties in particular uh, for making those spaces available. We are actively looking for more spaces uh, to do something similar. Um, certainly downtown State Street area, but also beyond that, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And we've already seen our, our first graduate from the pop-up shops uh, into her own uh, retail storefront, and uh, I hope we'll see more of that. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm really excited about, but, but maybe uh, something that's been a, a little quieter, but I think is even more exciting is our commercial ownership assistance program. Um, so this is a, a program where existing businesses can come to the city and get a quarter million dollar forgivable loan um, that to help them buy their storefront or a new location uh, for their business to move into. Um, and it's focused on um, owners that are uh, have, have historically faced barriers to capital. Um, and so we've got uh, so far four of these out there, um, all four uh, were businesses that we've helped are majority owned by people of color. And um, there's just some really great examples here. Anesis Therapy is one of them. Um, JP's Barbershop uh, partnered up with the owner of Knit Circus Yarns um, to buy their entire complex 
So now not only are they property owners, they're also landlords for a bunch of other businesses, which is, I think, just going to be a great situation. So we're going to continue that work. Um, and, it, you know, I don't have to tell anybody who's in business that ownership makes a difference, right? And so I, that's something that we're really trying to, to push on. Um, we also have been running um, our uh, cooperative program where we are helping co-ops to get started um, or helping um, maybe a, a individual owner um, who is ready to retire, wants to maybe convert the business to employee owned. Um, you know, you can get support from the city uh, to do those things. And um, we're, we've got a great partnership with the Madison Cooperative Development Coalition um, and also working with the folks at UW uh, on, on co-op issues. So that's, that's something that we will also be continuing, I think is, um, you know, it's a slightly smaller thing, but I think it's positive for our community. And, you know, we've got all these other programs. We've got the Kiva Madison program for Kiva loans. We work with Webex. Um, we work with the um, with the chambers, and you referenced the chambers already, the, the Black Chamber, the Latino Chamber, the Hmong Chamber, um, just trying to support their function mm -hmm. um, so they can help their businesses. That's, I think, a partnership that will continue. Um, and then, so, you know, that's a lot of the, the sort of, um, you know, what is the, the city like pushing outwards in terms of technical assistance, access, support, funding, and, um, you know, we'll continue to do that. I'm interested in, um, you know, are there more ways that we can support um, affordable commercial space uh, is something that I'm, I don't want to say too much more about that because we're not there yet. But I think that uh, particularly for smaller businesses is a real issue. And um, I, I think there's some interesting things that we might be able to do. So that's something that to sort of preview that we're working on. Um, but then there's also uh, the things that we can do um, with our own spending, right? And so looking at um, how does the city spend our money on um, contracts, on purchasing, uh, how do we direct more of that locally? How do we direct it to um, disadvantaged businesses? And that's, I mean, we, we obviously already do a lot of this, but I, I think we can just get better at it. Um, particularly in the public works world, um, you know, we really are leaning into how we can diversify the contracting community and um, connect, you know, subs to primes. And, you know, our Department of Civil Rights is doing a lot of work on this and, and more to come. You know, I think that there's, um, there's a big push on, we, uh, internally we call the work contracting equity. Um, so I, I think more to come there. And then, you know, there's the sort of workforce piece. Right. And, and this is something that you and I have talked about uh, in the past a lot that um, we struggle as a community to attract and retain professionals of color. And now I think uh, it's accurate to say that we are all struggling with workforce. Right. And so uh, we are thinking a lot about how we um, create workforce pipelines, both internally for the city, but also um, just to offer opportunity for training, education, internships for folks that even if they start out in the city, they can you know, go out into the community and, and find good opportunities. So we've got our internship programs. We've got our apprenticeship programs. We're working hard on building um, career pathways within the city, um, but also making sure that we're connecting uh, that outward um, to try and diversify um, you know, the, the trained workforce that's available. Well, speaking of workforce, um, and you talked, you know, I think you, you used the words collaboration and partnership are sort of the things that have stuck uh, with us through uh, this ordeal. Um, and early on in the pandemic, we started highlighting childcare as going to be a problem. We, and it's not a big piece of our membership, but we just started looking at, wait, how do these things get put back together? And um, childcare was going to be one of those things. And then, you know, you know us with partnering with United Way, the city of Madison, uh, you know, we set out to raise money for families to help, you know, the city funded it, business funded it, um, the United Way, but helping people, uh, families send their children to child care. You know, we've had two stories locally now. We've got a work group with the United Way and us. Um, you know, I think more and more people are realizing this is an opportunity to take some kind of big swing. This is a maybe even a definitional moment for Madison to say, um, you know, we can do this differently and better. 
Um, but from, you know, I, I know something you care about. Um, we you know, cared about when we were on the council together, you care about now as mayor. But I'm curious as to like, how do you see it? I mean, we see it as an economic imperative, but from your, from your seat, sitting in your office, how do you look at childcare? How do we keep it affordable? How do we get providers the resources they need and parents the ability to actually afford it? Yeah, this is, this is I think, um, absolutely a critical issue for the community. And I'm really glad that the chamber has leaned in on it. Um, you know, we were um, having issues with the childcare workforce pre-pandemic and it's only gotten worse. And um, there's tremendous turnover in childcare workers. Um, uh, you know, places that uh, would like to be providing more childcare can't because they can't find the workforce to do it. And a lot of that is about wages and benefits. Um, and, um, you know, and then on the other side, of course, there's the afford affordability issue. You, you know, the city, I think, is um, when you look at us compared to other cities, we've really early and often leaned in on, on child care and um, trying to um, help uh, improve the quality of the workforce and their ability to attract higher wages, um, supporting um, subsidizing child care for families that need it. Um, but there's there's only so much we can do as a local government. Um, I think this is going to take a partnership um, with the private sector, frankly, and recognizing that child care is um, a defining issue for workers, uh, for employees, and that um, we are all going to need to lean in more on um, recognizing that as a critical benefit to provide for folks. And so that's something that I think has got to happen um, in partnership with the private sector. And, um, you know, I at least was hopeful. I imagine many of us were hopeful that the federal government would do something on this. And um, maybe they still will. And um, I certainly hope so. But, uh, but we can't um, stop thinking about it at the local level, because I'm not going to hold my breath on Congress acting on this. Um, so I think it's, it's something that we you know, have got to keep talking about, um, you know, we're going to keep doing our best to support childcare providers. Um, but I, I really do think that we need um, the private sector to lean in on this in a big way. So I, I want to get to some other local things like BRT and affordable housing and crime. Um, but you did just come back from the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, and I'm, you know, maybe very quickly on this one so we can get to the other local things that I know people um, are interested in. But what did you hear from your fellow mayors? I mean, what was kind of the message that you were delivering in Washington? So, um, yes, it was a, it was a great to be back in person with the mayors. And I have to say that um, the Biden administration was really good to us. We had many, many secretaries there to talk with, which was great. Um, and then the president himself came uh, as well. Um, I, I would say there were, I mean, obviously we talked about a lot of different things, but some major topics, um, certainly the bipartisan infrastructure law was a major topic of conversation, uh, but also gun violence, um, learning from other cities how they're dealing, everybody's experiencing the problems uh, that we're experiencing and, and so trying to learn from other cities uh, what their approaches are. Um, you talked a lot about equity, it talked a lot about climate change. Um, and, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, how to best support local economies. It's something that I think all the mayors care about. Um, I also had the opportunity to meet with both the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation and had some, you know, really fruitful conversations there as well. Okay. Well, speaking of transportation or transit, um, uh, you know, I think it's great to see how close we are coming to getting BRT, bus rapid transit off the ground. Um, it, I know there are conversations that are still continuing around downtown and there are still small businesses on the street that are worried about the sort of long-term investments that might be on the street. But I'm curious as to what's the latest on those discussions, what's the latest news, you know, how, how close are we truly to getting bus rapid transit finally done in Madison? I think we're much closer than we've ever been. I'm excited. I hope that the compromise that we've struck downtown um, will, you know, ultimately be a good thing for everyone. Um, you know, we are in, we're working our way towards 50% design on the system um, and uh, working through the environmental process uh, because it's a, a federal project. Um, and, you know, the next step is to, to you know, get everything approved and signed uh, with the Federal Transit Authority um, and move into construction. 
um, the the I mean, I guess I should take a step back. I assume most people know the project, but you know, we're talking about the East West line. Um, it's going to stretch from you know Sun Prairie to the west side, hopefully also get to Middleton as well, where that's sort of a conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, this is going to be frequent, fast, all day service along the corridor. Um, and, uh, you know, really just um, take transit to the next level in Madison. Um, the, the, probably the, the biggest new thing here is that um, you know, we've been having some conversations with the Federal Transit Authority um, because of the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's there's pretty strong support for electric vehicles in that law. Um, now, we had planned on having a portion of our buses be electric from the get go, um, but didn't think we could afford to have them all be electric. And um, now we are uh, very seriously moving towards a fully electric fleet. Wow. Um, which I think will make a tremendous difference. Um, it's obviously a win for the climate. I think it's a win for our community. And I am very hopeful um, that that's what we're going to be able to get to. That's great. So um, we had Chief Barnes on last month. Um, and so I'm interested in the question we asked him as well, because uh, it's something we hear often, both within the community and then from other parts of the state. Um, you know, I've been lectured by congressmen from other parts of the state. Um, and it's a perception that Madison is experiencing more violent crime, more crime in general. Um, and so, and obviously uh, the appearance of crime and the reality of crime weigh heavily on how we are perceived and how we present ourselves as a community. But what do you say to those that say Madison is less safe today than it was before? Well, I, I mean, I think it's important to know that overall uh, in, in all the categories, right? Crime is down year, year over year. Um, but gun violence, uh, particularly gun violence and car thefts are up. Um, and this is true really all across the country. Um, and it, I ascribe it particularly to the pandemic, um, which makes sense. It's, it's likely driven by increased economic hardship, increased disconnection and lack of family stability. Uh, you know, I think everybody's not to be too colloquial about it, but everybody's gone a little bit crazy during the pandemic. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, for some people that manifests in violence, unfortunately. And so again, some that all cities are dealing with, um, and we're trying to learn from how other cities are, are approaching this as well. But um, I hope that you, when you talked with the chief, you, um, you talked with him about his strategic planning work that he's done. And um, I think that, um, you know, he's really taking a data informed approach. And so the strategic planning work that they did um, last summer, I think was very impactful and successful. Um, he's continuing that work. I expect we'll see similar results um, uh, moving forward. Um, and I have a lot of confidence in his approach. Um, to this. Now, obviously, that's policing is only part of it, right? Um, so our violence prevention unit, which lives in public health, is working with a broad uh, coalition of community groups to take a public health approach to violence, which I think is really important. Part of that approach is dealing with root causes, um, but it's not just that. Um, the public health approach also um, is doing immediate interventions, particularly in gun violence situations, and focusing on connecting both the, the victims and the offenders um, with resources and programs that, um, and I'm gonna use a little bit of public health language here, right, but that are protective against gun violence, right? So if you, if you think of it in a public health context, you're looking for things that um, will protect people from um, from participating in gun violence in the future. And, and that's something that uh, our Office of Violence Prevention is, is working really hard on. Well, we're, we're gonna run out of time. Um, we only have a minute left and I have like five more questions that I wanted to ask you. So you're gonna have to come back on again so we can talk about affordable okay. housing, TIF policy, other uh, challenges facing the community. Um, but I do have one last question before you go. Um, like I said, it's been 686 days since you and I had our first conversation on this platform. In those 686 days, what's the most important thing you've learned about yourself during the pandemic? Mm, what a great question, Zach. Um, I don't know about the most important thing, but but here's a, a few thoughts. Um, I think I've learned a lot about my capacity for resilience and hard work. There's been some really long days um, and stretches where it's really just nose to the grindstone and you got to get it done. Um, I don't know that I 
realized previously that capacity. Um, you know, we all stretch ourselves during crises. Um, I think another thing that has really come to light is the importance of balancing the immediate what's before you, I've got to solve this problem, um, and the importance of the long view and planning. And, and in part, uh, you know, I think the, the economic work that we've talked about uh, is part of that because we knew that we needed to take some immediate steps around COVID-19, but we also knew we had to be planning long-term for how we were gonna recover out of this. And so we started thinking, I think way sooner than many people did around, uh, you know, how were we gonna tap into federal money and how are we gonna help the community recover economically? And, and that work obviously is ongoing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I hope we've all learned this, um, but I certainly have learned the importance of self-care and uh, making sure that you're taking care of yourself so that you continue to, uh, you know, in my case, be able to, to serve the community well. Great. Well, Mayor, I want to um, thank you for coming on. Um, I'm glad the mask order has ended so that we didn't have to spend all of our time going back and forth on the mask order today, uh, although I think some of the viewers would have would have enjoyed that. Um, so, but thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you for uh, continuing to be a partner um, and not letting disagreements make us disagreeable. I think that is the way it's supposed to work. I also want to thank all of you for attending and our presenting sponsor, Perkins Cooey, as long as our um, Accelerate sponsor, Baker Tilly, and our new small and emerging business sponsor, uh, Easy Office Products. Thanks for supporting this program. Mayor, thanks. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Take care.